my name is Christopher Mark. I have a kind of a soil consultancy vineyard kind of uh, company that works with uh, kind of soil optimization, stuff like that called Vitality. Anthony, uh, who also is kind of a co-host and has helped put this together as a financial planner. He works with small businesses and does insurance and group benefits and things like that. And we just kind of did this to help people. Um, so what we're going to be doing here is, oh, and just upcoming. So next week, as you, a lot of you probably know, we've got uh, Mark Hicken and Al uh, Huda coming on to talk about reopening as well as kind of some of the liquor law stuff that's come out. But obviously a big discussion around reopening, what that is going to look like, uh, what that uh, should look like, um, and kind of planning around that. I'm going to introduce our two speakers. Really excited today. Uh, really, you know, kind of two really impressive people. We have a uh, first Jerry uh, Murray of Project M Wines in Oregon. Uh, they were really quick when kind of what's going to be really cool about their story is uh, they were really quick kind of getting onto virtual tastings. Obviously, that's what we're talking about today. And they've really kind of built, you know, it's been uh, significant for their business, just moving quickly and then kind of adapting to what kind of consumers need and providing that experience. Uh, Eddie Turner, who's all is going to be talking about kind of communication, uh, especially kind of in front of the camera, obviously a very dynamic, I mean, you guys are going to see a very dynamic speaker and presenter. So really excited to, I mean, I can't, and I'll let you, I'll let Jerry and Eddie, you guys can speak a little bit more to your background. I mean, your guys' bios are long and uh, story. So feel free to speak a little bit more to that. So what we're going to do right now is I'm going to turn it over first to Jerry and he's just going to share a little bit of his story and kind of how he got to, um, you know, virtual, like how they pivoted and obviously dealing with the crisis specifically within the perspective of uh, virtual tastings. Uh, we're going to talk through a little bit of kind of linearly how that works. And then we're going to also then kind of turn it over to Eddie as well around that communication, how to communicate in front of a camera. And we'll have a little bit of dialogue with Eddie and, and Jerry from there. So hopefully that sounds good. And uh, Jerry, please uh, start us off. Tell us a little bit of what's happened and uh, yeah, how you adapted, especially with the virtual tastings. Excellent. Uh, so uh, I'm Jerry Murray from Project M Wines in Oregon. Uh, we launched Project M in 2016. Uh, it was my 19th vintage as a winemaker. Uh, and prior to, just prior to launching Project M, I was uh, Champagne Louis Roeder's first still winemaker in the United States at a project in uh, the Anderson Valley in California called Domain Anderson. Prior to that position, I had held several winemaking positions here in Oregon. Um, project M is small, uh, so uh, my title is winemaker, but it's also a night janitor, bookkeeper. If it doesn't get done, it's because I didn't do it. And so when, you know, suddenly there was just one day where all of our sales channels basically froze, uh, tasting rooms closed restaurants closed. Um, we didn't have a strong distribution network. We were developing one. I had just been in uh, San Francisco a week before shelter in place went in place. Uh, uh, the month before that, I was in Arizona trying to develop a market. So all of those came to a screeching halt. And um, like everybody else, it's like, what do we do? Uh, and we weren't the first to jump into the virtual tasting. I wanted to see what people were doing. And most of what I saw virtual tastings as were essentially either shop owners, sommeliers, or winemakers standing in front of a camera talking about a wine that nobody could taste. Uh, and I, I have an eight-year-old, and she used to watch these YouTube videos of people opening boxes, and it was just hands in the box. And that's what these tastings reminded me of. They didn't strike me as terribly engaging. They struck me as odd. Uh, and as a winemaker, I don't know anybody who really wants to listen to a winemaker go on for 40 minutes. Uh, so we wanted to do something different. And uh, part of what Project M does, we consider ourselves storytellers. So we wanted to optimize for story. So the first thing we did is we got... Um, you know, we came up with the idea for the virtual tastings. We got it online. So there's a special part of our website that's virtual tastings. And that will later in the story prove to be valuable. Uh, then I went through and I specifically created packs um, of specific combinations of wines with an idea. So there's a theme to the tasting. Uh, one of them is a portfolio pack where it basically it has our sparkling rosé, our Riesling, our Chardonnay and one of our Pinots, our entry level Pinot Noir. And then from there we got into more specific um, 
Pinot Noir packs essentially, because that's primarily what we are. So there's a, uh, a pack that I call the Vintages and Vineyards pack, where we, it's essentially a vertical of two vineyards, so four wines. Uh, another one was the Taste of Place. So all 2017 vintage for the single vineyards we bottle so that these are, are sort of themes that people can wrap their head around. Uh, and uh, the last one is a formative forces uh, pack, which is the way we structure our Pinot Noir production and eventually our Riesling production and Chardonnay production will be, uh, everyone tells a story, stories told in three chapters, people, place, and time. We make wines for each of those chapters. So the formative forces uh, gets into that. So the price points on these are, uh, 200, uh, 220 for the three Pinot, around 220 for the three Pinot packs, and 130 for the uh, um, portfolio pack. We subsidize shipping on the four pack shippers uh, on the Pinot Noir uh, want, uh, packs. The portfolio pack, we offer flat rate shipping for $15. Uh, and we did that essentially because everything you buy now, seemingly other than wine, is free shipping. So, uh, we quickly moved to free shipping on everything over six bottles uh, at Project M. And then we essentially offered free shipping on these packs to try to incentivize it. Um, and we don't offer any discounting on the wines themselves until they move up to six. If they move up to six bottles, they can get a, uh, if they want to add other wines to it, they can bring it down. So part of that is we wanted to frame the story. We wanted to give the consumer relatively easy choices to make instead of looking at what for us would be 10 different SKUs and trying to figure out what here and there, we made it very simple. So uh, sort of off the shelf tastings with the option for things to be custom. Uh, and um, we put it out there in the world like everybody else did. And something about our SEO got picked up and Washington Post found us and did an article. And then we started to see basically along the East Coast, a lot of orders coming in. And uh, so then we built, you know, basically built a, a workflow to sort of accommodate this. And some of the things we did is we wanted to sort of be in control of the timeline of things. So uh, people purchase a wine uh, to sort of set up the workflow, describe it for you. People purchase a wine. Uh, we then ship it. Once it's shipped, we send an email. Uh, I created um, what I call the virtual tasting guide. Uh, so it's an email that has a link to our square um, scheduling calendar. Uh, that's not an open calendar that anybody can access through a search. It's only through this link so that people can't start to, in, you know, interrupt the workflow. Uh, and we send that out. It also has some tips to make this more successful. We offer a couple of links to friends of ours that produce cheeses and, and charcuterie. We basically talk about glasses you know, how many glasses do you need? Well, you only need one. Uh, what kind of glasses? Well, you know, fruit jar will work if that's what you have. Uh, but we also give them options to go uh, links to Riedel and Schatz Weissel to go buy uh, glasses if they feel like they're in a place to make that investment. So we wanted to sort of have something for them at the beginning that gets them excited before the event starts to happen. So then they confirm the appointment. And then a few days before the appointment, we then send the uh, Zoom link. So I think one of the important things here, and when I was speaking with the Washington Post reporter, you know, I was sort of nervous about, you know, the cost of things. And she had some really good points that I sort of have digested considerably since then. And one of them was right now, the, the bar is very low in terms of high points of somebody's day. Um, and both in terms of frequency, there's not a lot of exciting things that happen throughout a, a day right now. And the amplitude is relatively low. So we have an opportunity as a winery to do something that we always want to do is to really sort of be a very important event in somebody's life. Uh, and so she pointed out that, you know, uh, having something to look forward to. When somebody orders one of these packs, they have something to look forward to. Uh, and so that's what really got me thinking about developing the virtual tasting guide and breaking this into steps so that when that email pops up, it re-excites uh, the anticipation of the event. And I think that does a couple things. One, it keeps them engaged. Uh, it's also, you know, sort of, there's some empathy. We're, we're giving them something to be excited about, but also creates an anticipation for the end experience 
uh, and if we can set high expectations, um, I think it's much easier for us to deliver them. Um, so that was sort of the workflow and the idea. Um, and things like, you know, what I'm thinking about now, for instance, is when that box shows up, what can I do to make opening that box a more exciting experience? Again, relatively low amplitude, low frequency. I could really make someone's week just by that box arriving and them opening that. So I'm thinking about how can we do that uh, and ideas like that as far as the tasting. So then once we finally get to the tasting, uh, we do encourage multiple group tastings um, because, again, I think what people are really buying when they buy these tasting packs isn't a wine it's connection with a stranger and it may also be a connection with people uh, that they, they, they haven't gotten to see or communicate with recently. So we're seeing people, you know, families spread across the country are buying these packs and all coming together. We've done birthdays, uh, which is sort of a little messy, uh, but uh, a little sloppy is probably a better word to describe it. Some people are having more fun than others. Um, but again, you know, we're sort of open to that. Uh, in fact, we encourage it because if I'm going to take an hour to go through this tasting and if I sell one portfolio pack for 130 for an hour, eh, you know, it's not, the results aren't that great, but if I can get five people on there, suddenly it's a better return. So we really encourage the bigger groups uh, to some extent, five, six people. Uh, and we have since created uh, documents on the website you know, uh, frequently asked questions to sort of help people understand that. We also created an infographic to describe the process that if a group wanted to do a multi-site, a multi-group tasting, what's that process look like? I'm not going to be the one that coordinates with everybody when the appointment is. It's like you designate somebody that does that. You guys choose the path. I'm happy to answer questions, but I'm not going to do it for you. Uh, so creating that infographic to help people understand the process better. Uh, and then once the tasting starts, we basically go in and we taste wines with them. We talk to them. I'm, I talk as much about the wines as they want to know. Again, I think the wines are secondary to this, and that's hard for wineries to uh, accept and understand, myself included, being the winemaker. It's, it's not about anything else, but it is. It's about something very much other than the wines. So we're interested in communicating with them, talking to them, and basically talking about the wines as much as they want to know about the wines. And then whatever else comes up, we sort of go into the tangents. And what we found is that it's very well received. Uh, in fact, some of our customers, we've had customers or experiences the following day, they've booked another pack. So again, I think that's an important feature of having the multiple packs sort of pre-done so that they can then say, well, that was a great experience. What would this one be like? Uh, and we've really taken advantage of that. Uh, so I think, you know, really understanding that people aren't buying wine, they're buying connection and um, something to look forward to and possibly connection with a larger group is a really important part of these tastings. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jerry. I think there's obviously a lot of great stuff we're going to dive a little bit down into. I liked, really liked your point about, you know, right now the bar is low for what we're doing. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn it over to Eddie, um, and he's going to share a little bit about the kind of communication aspect, and then we're going to, you know, get some questions with Jerry and Eddie, uh, kind of around this. So, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you right now, Eddie, kind of around communications. Why don't you take it away? Very good. So, uh, as Christopher said, I am Eddie Turner. Let me start to, to share with you my slide deck here. And I am not, hopefully, we'll get this working there. All right, wonderful. All right. So as Christopher said, I'm Eddie Turner, the Leadership Accelerator. I work with leaders to accelerate performance and drive impact. Normally, the primary way I do that is through executive coaching, facilitation, and through keynote speaking. I'm also the host of the Keep Leading podcast. So why am I here tonight? to talk to you all about virtually delivering wine tastings. And not only how to deliver them, but how to knock them out the park. Well, that's because in my work, I wasn't always a leadership consultant. Previously, I spent years in information technology and I started to blend my communication skills with my technology skills. And I piloted ways 
for organizations to deliver programming around the world, even at the executive level. And the work that I've done since the last financial crisis and that I was brought to Houston, Texas to help when the oil crisis hit, I am now pulling that playbook out again and helping organizations just like yours during this time. So it is my pleasure because of Christopher Mark to be here with the BC Wine Weekly and to talk about how we can knock it out the park. Before we begin, I would love for you all, just as you did with the cameras, to be engaged. Now, how can you be engaged? You don't have to wait. It is not rude. If you have a question, a reaction, please go ahead and type it into the chat box. You don't have to wait. Now, on this platform, unfortunately, the way we're doing this, I can't see the chat box. <laughs> But uh, put it in there, and I'm going to ask Christopher that as they come in, if there's something to pitch that to me, and go ahead and interrupt me. You don't have to wait. There's something else I'd like for you to do. Some people are dialing on mobile devices. They're not sitting at a computer. So I would like one finger engagement from you. Well, what do I mean by that? Give me an exclamation mark. That's all you have to do. If you agree with what I'm saying, you like something I'm saying, go ahead and hit that exclamation mark and let us know. And if I ask a question that's yes or no, simply hit the Y or hit the N. Do you agree with what I'm asking you to do? And I'm gonna assume that we have exclamation marks coming in now. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, I think I figured out that I can actually cheat and see, there it is, I do see it. All right, excellent. Kathy says yes. Leslie says yes. Oh, I got a lot of yeses coming in, and I got a few exclamation marks. Eliana gave me an exclamation mark, and so did a uh, phone number. A <laughs> phone number there. I don't know a name. And so is Serena. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Thank you all very much. So now, let me share a few brief statistics with you, if I may. In March 2020, 200 million people or daily participants used Zoom. The month that just concluded, April, we saw 300 million people daily using Zoom. What makes that number so significant? Less than 10 million people were using it in December 2019. So what does this tell us? This tells us what we've already figured out. Everybody is using Zoom. Everybody's online. They're online for something. They're online not just for work, not just for business, but bar mitzvahs, birthdays, funerals. There are uh, my church services. They're on Zoom now. Happy hour. Doctor's visits. My wife did a doctor's visit the other day. That was on Zoom. So the whole world is on Zoom. And that means that so do you, business owners, need to do your wine tastings on Zoom. But the question becomes, oh, Kathy says book clubs. Thank you for letting me know that, Kathy. I got to add that to my list then. And in fact, I think John earlier said he's tired of Zoom because it's even eating into the time with his girlfriend. <laughs> So, yes, so some of us are Zoomed out, or they're calling us Zoombies. <laughs> yes, 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 and uh, tap dancing classes, uh, someone's telling me. So wonderful. Everybody is using Zoom, so we should also use it for our wine clubs. All right, um, so, uh, and I seem to have made a mark on the slide there, but okay. So what do you need to do if you're going to do this successfully? The answer is create an experience. Uh, Jerry was talking about, he, he asked one question. He says, why am I making these packs? The answer he said was, people are buying a connection and something to look forward to. He's absolutely right. I take it a step further and I'd say they are buying an experience. So how do we create the experience? I refer to the work of Joe Pine and Jim Gilmore in their landmark work, uh, the experience economy. And in the experience economy, the first version here that I'm showing you on the left that came out in 1999, I love the sub uh, uh, title. The subtitle is Work is Theater and Every Business is a Stage. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, 
that work is theater or the wine business is theater and every screen becomes your stage right now to get your sales, to reach your customers. This was the best selling, one of the 100 best business selling books of all time. They updated it in 2011 and just in December of 2019, they released the third version, uh, a re revised version for the 20th anniversary. I love this update, competing for customer time, attention, and money. And that's what every one of us is doing right now. You want to get your wine product, your liquor product, whatever you're selling is a part of the tastings into the customer's hand. But right now, other things have their time. Other things have their attention and their precious dollars. However, they will spend if we create an experience. So there's a lot of ways we could do that. And in that model, it, share, it gives us a couple of ways to, to make that unfold. However, I won't go into all of it. I'll just share a couple things. Number, uh, we'll share a couple uh, key concepts from the book. Number one, the 4E experience. It must be educational. When you hold the online wine tasting, it's got to be educational, right? You're going to tell people about the wine, where it came from, the year, what makes it so special, how it's paired with food or particular events, what it goes well with. You will educate people. And that's one of the reasons they come. But it's how we do it. We have to do it in such a way that they feel they have escaped when they come to the event. They feel they've escaped. They're not even thinking about what's next. They are truly engaged in what you're delivering. The other thing that's important is the aesthetics. We must provide aesthetics online. For example, uh, even when we were in the waiting room earlier, indulge me if you would, I'm going to press stop for a moment. And then when I press stop, the next thing I'd like to engage with. So here's just one element. We're talking about the aesthetics. We're talking about being entertaining. Here's one thing I want to share. I'm going to adjust my volume here. And let's just see what this sounds like. Everybody hears that sound. Give me a thumbs up if you hear that sound. Okay. All right. I see Sheila and she's over there. She started doing one of these with me. I appreciate that. Yeah. Marie says, good. All right. Wes gives me an exclamation mark. So if you're inviting people to a wine tasting, you got to give them a little mood music, right? Give them mood music. Set the tone. And now that we have the music going, even though it's virtual, we've given them the education. Part of the aesthetics are what the environment is, right? So you've got your music selection that you've made. You know, that's a little jazzy tune on the audience maybe we go with something a little bit more traditional we go a little bit more give them a little uh bach right but we can set the tone it makes all the difference right so i just wanted to illustrate that a little bit to, to make the point about what i was saying when it comes to uh the aesthetics right when we're in a physical room you would make sure that things were a certain way. That's not the case here, right? Since it's online, we don't want to feel like we still can't control the aesthetics and what the experience is that we're giving people. So that's uh, one method in which we would do that. Something else I'd like to share with you, obviously it has to be entertaining. So we'll go back to the slide deck here. Uh, it has to be entertaining. The reason this happens is, I can go into this later, you move people essentially from being passive to being active. And it's an immersive experience where people then can absorb. Now, one of the things that's happened is when you move things online and you try to do a wine tasting, one of the things that of course you lose, we have five senses. One of the things you will lose, of course, is the sense of smell and the sense of taste. Now, this hasn't happened to me, but to people in my life who it's happened to would have lost one sense. Uh, they tell me that the others become heightened. So how can you and I heighten the other senses that people will rely on in an online experience, on a virtual experience? Well, there's three other uh, features, right? So they have learning styles, right? Visual, auditory, kinesthetic. 
Well, visual, of course, is what you're going to show them. You're going to show the wine. You're going to show the cheese. You're going to show whatever it is that you want them to see. And in some cases, that's enough for some people. How many times have we been watching an event on television and we see a commercial? We see that cheeseburger, that mouth-watering cheeseburger or whatever that meal is that the fast food companies do to us. And we, we can almost savor it in our mouth without even physically tasting it, right? So visually, if we give a lot of thought to it, we can do a lot to make it engaging. Auditory, I just uh, showed a little experiment with what we're doing with the auditory senses by including music in our delivery or in the lobby, like when we were all gathering at the beginning, having a little music going really goes a long way to setting the tone and the energy in the room. Finally, kinesthetic. You'll notice how many times I've demonstrated for you by me picking up my glass physically. There's something that happens to your subconscious brain every time I do this. So kinesthetics, when you visually show, show yourself touching something, it triggers something on the other side, right? So as a part of your wine tastings, you wanna really engage every aspect of the senses. To be more dynamic, there's a couple of things I'll, I'll give you. I'll just do a quick run through these. I won't do a deep dive. If you'd like to do a deep dive, let me know. And again, if you have a question or something, you can stop me. We said you gotta turn up the other senses since you're losing two key senses to your industry. So let's talk about auditory. We're gonna turn up auditory, there's three Ps. Your pitch, your pace, your power. No matter how strong your voice is, you can help yourself tremendously by using a microphone, an amplifying device, as opposed to speaking in a room and letting your voice in a room that if you have hard, nice hardwood floors, letting your voice bounce off those floors and be echoey doesn't do a lot to help your voice. And if your voice is being lost, you are not able to engage your audience and pull them in. So your pitch, the pitch of your voice. And when you show excitement, it's contagious. You must engage people by how you feel about your product online. So my pitch goes way up when I'm showing you excitement. But now when it comes time to talking about the dollars, I may lower it. <laughs> right? So we lower our pitch when we want to connote something a little bit more serious, right? A little more deliberate. The other thing we'll do is we'll measure our pace. We don't want to run through words with a lot of words right? You don't want to run through your sentences. Say your words slowly, enunciate. At times, pick up the, the, the pace. At times, slow it down. Insert pauses. This becomes very, very important because again, how we speak, it's, it's, a, it's a hearing pattern for some of our listeners that affects buying decisions. And our power how strongly we say certain things. You must add variety to your voice. Your voice cannot be a straight line. My friends in the medical field tell me that when you see a flat line, you've lost the patient. Well, online, if you are flatlining with your voice, you will lose your buyers. You must add variety to your voice. Remember the three Ps. There's three S's. Think about how you sit, your posture, how we show up on the camera, the distance. You should be an arm's length away from your camera. The camera should not look up at your nostrils, <laughs> right? So how we are sitting and positioning ourselves on the screen, that matters to your buyer. And then are you just staring into the screen with no life? Or is your face animated, right? Your face becomes your most powerful signal sender. So think about that when you're online, right? All right, so finally, uh, the last thing I would say to you is how you communicate becomes very important. You want to turn, uh, use your ears as we talked about, uh, use your voice and tell powerful stories about why that product is so important, what people can do with that product. And when you tell a story in the right way, you turn people's ears, into eyes. And that's the power of effective storytelling. Also, your stories allow you to seed 
your sale. You should not have to come out and ask for the sale directly. All right. Uh, if uh, I'm, I'm I was told uh, that one of the questions was, how do you sell without having to sell directly? So in some cases, you see it in your stories. So I didn't do that in my message with you tonight. But essentially what happens is you tell a story about how you used the wine at an event, what the result was, what the outcome was, right? And then because of the customer success, people will start to ask for that. All right. So I'm going to stop right there and just say that the secret to knock out virtual wine tastings is to create an experience. And you create an experience by what you are doing with your physical being, how you show up how you communicate and by what you do. Thanks a lot, Eddie. That, uh, yeah, that was awesome. Uh, I got a ton of notes here and I know we're definitely gonna, I'm gonna send these out afterwards because there's a big takeaway there. Um, you know, I really enjoyed too, just kind of this idea of playing with pace and the importance too of, you know, when you're excited, you know, elevating pitch versus maybe when you're selling, you wanna lower, you know, chill out a little bit more. Uh, and, you know, make sure there's adequate pauses and everything in there, communicate clearly. That was really good stuff. Thank you. So we've kind of got some questions. What, what we're going to do here just time-wise is I think uh, Antti and I have kind of a couple questions we've prepped for uh, uh, Jerry and Eddie. And then what we'll do is we'll open up the floor uh, to kind of more questions um, just from you guys. So if you guys want to kind of get ready or message Antti and I with uh, questions. Um, I think maybe the first question, and just for uh, both of you, and, and um, so maybe you both can answer this, we had was just around that actual selling experience, because obviously, ultimately, these virtual tastings, we want to sell wine, right? Like, that's the purpose at the end of the day. Um, so how do you, and, and I know, Eddie, you've touched on this a little bit, but then how do you transition where you're wanting to have a positive, entertaining experience to now, you now want to have a... a an actual sale, you want to communicate that without, uh, well, in integrating that into an experience. So how, how do you do that? Jerry, why don't you kick us off first? So I had some conversations with colleagues that were doing this as well, and they indicated that they found sort of the ask at the end to be very awkward, unlike in-person tastings where there was this expectation. And so we decided to not really do it. We do tell them that there'll be a follow-up email. And in that email, we make an offer uh, in terms of, uh, you know, a discount. Um, we do, again, sort of try to create an emotional connection to the wines. They do have the wines in front of them. Uh, but the, you know, based on the previous feedback from uh, some colleagues that indicated that it was awkward, I felt like I didn't want to end on an awkward uh, to even sort of like feel it out. And these are wineries that are very good at selling direct. So um, that's sort of been our approach, like create a, create a positive, great experience, try to develop a connection to the wine, try to develop an interest in the other packs as well. Uh, and then, you know, we'll mention the wine club during it. So we'll, we'll lay everything out uh, and then we'll come back uh, with a um, email thanking them for the time uh, that has an offer in it. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I was kind of alluding to that earlier, right? So where you, in cases where you can't, obviously, if you can make the ask, absolutely do it. I don't want to misconstrue what I was saying. Uh, in fact, one of my friends, she wrote the book, Ask Outrageously. The premise is you don't ask, you don't get. <laughs> so if you can ask, ask for it. Don't be afraid to ask. However, in a lot of scenarios, people are not allowing us to do that, or as Sherry's point was, people may feel uncomfortable with that. So that's where the ideal of seating comes in, right? So for me, in, in my leadership speeches, uh, my primary business is coaching, right? I will tell a success story about a client who I coached. And the inference is, this person had the success, you can have that success as well. It's not a made up story, it's a legitimate story. And in that story, I highlight the service, right? Um, in my intro today, for example, even, I said to you that I am the host of the Keep Leading podcast. Now, I did not show a slide of my podcast. 
I did not uh, show you a slide of anything else that I do. But just in my introduction, it was a nice little seating, not overt. Uh, it is who I am and what I do. And uh, other people will ask me later on, uh, hey, what's the link to your podcast? Or what did you say that was, right? The other thing that you saw me do is in my slides. In my slides, my contact information is on the footer of every single slide. That's intentional. It's subtle, right? Uh, my website is eddieturnerllc.com. That's very hard to say. So I bought the URL, askeddieturner.com. Easy to say, easy to remember, right? It still takes you to eddieturnerllc.com. But I found that every time I said LLC, was it L? Everybody got twisted around the LLC, right? Or they stopped just at my name. So I changed the URL that I give people simply for that reason. So subtly, just by putting it in the bottom third of my slides, dropping references occasionally, it's a subtle way of letting folks know that, hey, I have a service, but, and if you want it, great. If not, I'm not gonna shove it down, uh, shove it on you. While we wait for questions to come in, Chris, one other thing I'll say about what I was describing about um, how you design these experiences online, you don't have to try to do it on your own, by the way. I, I talked about some things that are important, but there are services out there. Uh, there are a lot of freelancers out there. You can get those on all, all the freelance sites uh, of people to do some of these things for you. So don't feel like this is something that you have to do on your own. I have a quick question. Um, I'm already getting kind of tired of these uh, online tastings. What's the next thing that's gonna happen in like a month that we can all move to? Um, to stay engaged because there's so many of them. I just, I'm finding I'm, I'm just, yeah, it's not going to last long for me. Do you have some ideas about what the next thing might be? So a lot of people are saying that a lot of people uh, use the phrase uh, zombies earlier. People are zoomed out, right? Uh, they're, they're tired of uh, all day meetings. The problem is we are facing uh, a new normal. Uh, we're facing a situation where we're not gonna go back to the world we knew in February anytime soon. So much has transitioned to virtual, even in industries I'm facing folks with who never wanted to see people work, work at home. Can't do it. All of a sudden within 48 hours, 72 hours, their whole operation was digitized. And so a lot of folks aren't gonna wanna go back to the office anytime soon. Uh, people are starting to move further away from the metropolitan areas and the cities and suburban life. And this has made that even better for them. The, the numbers came out from the emissions and uh, New York, it's down 30%, LA, 30%. Around the rest of the country, 60 to 70%. So people are seeing that, wow, maybe it is good that we don't have as many people in cars commuting. And then some people are saying, man, instead of having to have, pay for an office with rent and utilities, we can keep people at home and let them keep paying for it the way they're doing now. <laughs> so a lot of things are going to be digital. That's our new world. And it, it, it is tiring at times. I know my eyes hurt at the end of the day more than they did in the past. Um, but I, I think this is the way we're going to be looking at for a long time. I don't, I don't mind digital. I'm just getting tired of watching other people drink when oh. I'm not drinking. So I'm good with the digital, but even when I have a bottle that they've sent me and I'm opening it up at the same time, I'm not wanting to do that. I want to open it up with my dinner, not when I'm sitting on a, a computer looking at a screen. So, I mean, for me, it's the actual tasting format that's, that I'm finding um, it doesn't have a lot of legs so to speak. Got me on that one. <laughs> Gary, what do you think? Uh, we haven't found any pushback of people sort of yet um, not wanting to, to open the wines and taste them. And one thing that I, I have gotten feedback is that I have a glass with them. Um, now, I'll have a glass in my hand. You know, I'm not drinking nearly as much as they are. But uh, people are really responding to that. And I think in person, sometimes, you know, they respond to it. But there's something about this digital experience that you're having the glass with them. When they, when they have that feeling, it really, um, you know, pe people have commented on it. And I was surprised by that. So I make sure that I have wine uh, there uh, to talk about. Um, and again, I'm not 
you know, drinking per se, but I do have it as far as I'm not sitting on the other end of these experiences. Uh, so for me, it's always my wine uh, and I'm always in control of how much of it I drink. So I don't really know how to respond to that, but I, you know, I, I agree with Eddie. Um, the world's changed and people have asked me, is this something you'll continue to do after all this blows over? And I have to think that if there's demand for it, I'll definitely do it because somebody can visit my winery from New York city for $200, including 400, you know, a little over $200 with four wines. There's no way they could get here for anything less than two grand uh, before that. So I think it's a, it, it's, it's a high touch way. We're a high end brand, so we don't mind the high touch aspect of it. This is the way we would want to do things uh, in person or, you know, we do private tastings. We're associated with a tasting room, but it's not exclusively ours. Uh, so, you know, it is taxing and demanding, um, but we think that that's what sort of one of the defining features of our brand is. So one question I got in the chat was uh, just for Jerry around, if you're not making the sale uh, directly at the end of the, you know, this virtual event, um, kind of how are you then ending the virtual event and what's the call to back action you, when you are asking for the sale, what's the call to action that you're uh, doing? Uh, that's a good question with, in terms of the, how, how we close it up. Um, as we're sort of going, you know, I do tell them that there'll be a follow-up email. I also mentioned the other packs. So again, sort of suggestive selling without necessarily, you know, sort of putting it on. If you guys are interested, in, if you guys have groups, I also ask them, you know, if you could share this on social media, if you had a great experience, can you tell the world about it? Uh, and I think um, I haven't seen a lot of that activity. I think it has to do more with the demographic that I've been working with in terms of uh, their, their propensity for social media. Uh, but I think as we get into uh, younger crowds, we might see more of that. In terms of the call to action afterwards, it's, it's an offer. You know, this is a one-time offer. This is the only way to get a better deal than this right now is to join the wine club. And then I also have information about the wine club and I elaborate on some of the special features of that. Uh, one of the things we do with that is we have the your community so we describe uh, the ambassadors club as uh, and that's with an m um, is you join a community but when you join the community we we join yours and so we give our wine club members an opportunity if they have a cause that's important to them we will and they will use their network leverage their network we will set up an offer and a percentage of sales will go to that cause doesn't matter if it's you know, tax deductible or not. Uh, so things like that, an opportunity to sort of follow up with those things. Uh, that's something I, I see us refining as we get more feedback on it, uh, see what works, what doesn't. And I think that's a big part of this. I don't think anybody has found a silver bullet or if they have and you find out, let me know. Um, I don't have it. We're iterating constantly, learning from every one we do. Um, you know, and for instance, you know, if Eddie gets into doing virtual wine tastings, I'm dead in the water because that guy's great. You know, and he's, he's just very dynamic, a great presenter. Uh, and um, I'm hoping, you know, I'll, I'll take some of his tips to do that, but it's a constant iteration. It's also reading the, the room. If I, if I felt there was somebody that was really wanting that um, uh, sale, you know, if, they, if I felt somebody was ready, I, I wouldn't hesitate to push it. Um, but if the group's not, I would rather leave them warm as opposed to cold and then come back later with an opportunity. So it's a, it's a lot about reading the room all through the process. You know, what you talk about, where you go, what jokes you use, you know, sort of assessing what their sense of humor uh, and the states right now, you know, what sort of political divide you're on is, uh, you know, you can make one false move and, you know, it's all done pretty quickly. So uh, it's, it's a bit of a minefield, but reading, reading, the room, which is tough to, tougher to do with Zoom than it is in person. I just got a couple, uh, just in the chat here, a couple of quick technical questions for you, Jerry. Um, just for, first of all, how many return customers do you have that bought one of your package, did the virtual tasting, and then have come to buy another package? Do you know what those numbers are? Uh, right now, I think we're at about three or four, uh, but we're really started of, because I give about a 10 day lead between the purchase 
and the appointment. I've got more appointments in the future than I've actually done yet. Uh, so um, we're, we'll know more in two weeks, I guess, uh, is the best way to answer that. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, I get more, um, but, you know, it's probably, you know, at this point, 15 to 20 percent. Or, or relatively quickly too. So it's within a couple, you know, days they've done it. Um, so we'll see how, as time goes by. I also think a lot of people, you know, may have an ex virtual tasting experience with one winery and then move on to another winery. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's, that's a tasting room experience. The same thing happens there. Uh, and, you know, it's not that much different uh, virtually. And then have you thought about using smaller bottles um, for the tasting, like sending out smaller format bottles and then selling the uh, normal size 750 mils in the tasting package? Uh, the smaller, I think, obviously, and years ago when they came out with those little sort of single taste things that took the stove and screw caps, I, I thought, I was talking to one of our tasting room people and I was like, if we could figure out how to do a virtual tasting you know, and send those out, it'd be great. Uh, I think, you know, if we were looking at years of this, or if the uh, virtual tasting thing sticks around after the pandemic clears, I might consider that. But right now, there's not time. There's not time for me to, you know, rebottle things or to sort of put in place the technology. And quite honestly, uh, you know, my wife is big in sales. And if I were to pitch that to her, she would say, why are you selling a 375 when you can sell a 750 and or why are you selling her thing would be why are you selling four bottles when you can sell 12 and all of these are true so at some point i'm not interested in doing thousands of virtual tastings i'm interested in doing virtual tastings that already come with a sales component there's a good chance that if i were doing a private tasting at the winery somebody would walk out with fewer than four bottles so i've set a threshold saying i've sold four bottles to do this uh, and I'm comfortable with that. I'm not interested in not selling four bottles and having the opportunity to maybe sell four bottles. So there's a sort of a, uh, we, what we say at Project M is we do what we do. It's not for everybody. Thanks. I have a question for Eddie here as well. Um, and Jerry, feel free to hop in afterwards because you might have some comments. It's around premiumization. So a lot of us a lot of wineries obviously have focused on, uh, you know, selling a premium product, obviously, and it sounds like that's what Jerry does. So but one of the challenges is a lot of time where that soul is it's sold in a store by an experienced staff member or it's at the restaurant with the song who's telling the story. And now a lot of wine, wineries have, you know, premium brands and they now have to tell the story. And a lot of that time that they would have had or other people telling it is gone. So kind of in an online format, you know, like a virtual tasting, how can you, is there anything you can do additionally for a premium product to help sell it and tell that story? So with that, I get into what is the difference between branding and marketing. All of us, if I said the word right now, Volvo, in the chat, what comes to your mind? Safety, says Paul. Excellent. Safety family car. Sweden, says Wes. Yeah, Volvo, we automatically think safety, right? That's their brand. They are known for being the safe family car, right? The uh, marketing dollars, organizations spend millions of dollars to market, to tell you what to think about their brand, right? Well, social media has become an even playing field. So the question is, are we the world's best kept secret? So we have the ability to use social media to market ourselves at low cost or low cost, and then have our brand become known. So if your bottle of wine or your winery, you want to raise the profile, you can raise your brand by leveraging social media. What is happening here tonight is just one example of that. Uh, you could hold your own forum, your own Facebook Live, your own LinkedIn Live, and broadcast to people. Uh, it doesn't just have to be a session where everybody has come to you. Get, raise your profile where people know about you, and then people will start to come to you and you separate yourself from the next comp competitor. Yeah, to that, I think, you know, we've had discussions about there's an inability to scale this. And I think a couple of things to sort of think about is we're, we're a relatively new brand. We're a small brand. So for us, we are interested in identifying the minimum viable audience. 
everybody is not a Project M customer. Even, even if this thing takes off and my wildest dreams come true, I'm still at 10 to 15,000 cases. I don't want to be everywhere. I don't want to be everybody's one. That's not what I want to do. So what we're interested in doing is finding what I say is I'm looking for 10,000 people to buy one case a year. That's my objective. And with that, keeping that in mind, as I do this, suddenly that scale becomes much smaller. Uh, I'm not trying to speak to everybody so that I can look at the value of what I'm doing. Now, I would other also say that um, anybody that's interested in this idea of doing things that aren't scalable at the beginning of a brand or an experience, a movement, if you will, like these virtual tastings, is that um, there's a, a podcast uh, called Masters of Scale hosted by Reed Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn. And he does an episode with uh, the guys from Airbnb and he talks about this. The guys that started Airbnb would go in and take the photographs of people's apartments themselves. Now you look, you know, 10 years later, it's a huge company, but they started out doing things that did not scale. It goes back to that experience. Scalable experiences tend to be commodity experiences. And we're not a commodity winery. We're not looking for a commodity buyer. So we're not interested in sort of doing something that's simple and easy and everybody can have. Uh, we are interested in doing things that are small and fine and building that through the experience. At some point, we're going to have to scale that uh, if this continues if this continues on after uh, the COVID pandemic, we're gonna have to figure out how to scale it if there's demand for it. And that, I think the first step with that would be is training people to do it other than myself uh, so that we can have multiple people doing this. Uh, I would prefer to do that over sort of create stock videos that people would just sort of watch and send out. I think that's, that's again, that's a commodity approach to my thinking. Uh, so in terms of sort of that idea of, you know, ask yourself, are you a brand that's for everybody? Because uh, I worked, you know, for Rotor Estate and, you know, 20, everybody in the world is in the market for a $20 sparkling wine once a year. So that market is huge. And that's a completely different approach and sell and thought process than looking for 10,000 people to buy 12 bottles a year. Uh, so uh, that's sort of my thought on that, I guess. I, I, I concur with you 100%, Jerry, if I just may add, um, we don't select su su selection and exclusivity are the are, are elements of the best premier brands in the world. My favorite cologne, Clive Christensen, they don't wanna be bought by everyone. They like the title of the mo world's most expensive cologne. That's not the cologne you're gonna see that everybody purchases. But even the brand like a Clive Christensen has elevated their profile. Um, and by elevating their profile, even clamoring more for that exclusivity, even our premier uh, cards, the America Express Platinum cards. They don't want everybody to have that, <laughs> right? But there's still something that even though we want to be exclusive, we still want our brand to be known and it's the one people clamor for. And it's like, oh, you've got Jerry's wine? How'd you get that? <laughs> I've been wanting that for months. <laughs> uh, yeah, just if anyone has a, a final question. Throw one out there. Um, your experience and or recommendations around how long a virtual wine tasting should be? I allocate uh, an hour and 15 minutes for every tasting. Um, some tastings go on uh, longer than that. And that's sort of um, me sort of having fun with it and enjoying the conversation uh, because I too am isolated and sheltering in place. So communicating with strangers is as much as an interest to me as it is to them. Um, and then there are other groups where, you know, at 40 minutes, I'm trying to figure out how to get out of there, uh, you know? So I think being sort of ruthless with your time at some point and saying, you know, I think if you, if you book an hour appointment, you should be prepared to deliver an hour experience. If you find people are sort of winding down, not having, on here maybe you don't plan on going on for another hour um but uh i think sort of reading the room if they're ready to go to bed you know uh then yeah cut it short um but i don't think you need to feel obligated to go on longer make sure you get through the wines uh make sure you get plenty of time to ask questions and and develop the connection but i don't think if you you know at an hour 15 i'm more than happy to say well that's all the time we have for and go uh, but I give that hour and 15. That's what I would give if somebody visited me at the at the winery. 
Any uh, response and then maybe a closing comment? I'm not in the business, so I can't say how long it should go. <laughs> but I can tell you how long virtual meetings and all that should go, but uh, not, uh, not about a, a tasting. Uh, it's just been a, a true delight to be here with you all. Um, it's always on my list of where I, will I take my wife. She loves doing those things. And so it's a joy to be asked to be here with you all tonight. And uh, just an honor to be with you. Yeah, I think you. If I could just give a really quick closing thing, this is something to think about big time, is that nobody is ever going to forget anybody that's alive now that is capable of remembering between ages of, say, four and 104. If they can remember, they are never going to forget this time. And so that's an opportunity for you as a winery or anybody providing a virtual experience to really set a high point in a period of not a lot of high points that nobody will ever forget. And I think if we think about that, we have an opportunity, a greater opportunity than we would have with wine dinners or tasting room experiences to build customers for life. We have an opportunity to make the big splash and we don't have to work nearly as hard at it as we would if we weren't sheltering in place. So, you know, see this, think of the long term, uh, play the long game, continue to play the long game. That's really hard to do right now. We'd like to think of the short term because we got to survive to win. But uh, um, think about it, play the long game and realize that you can be a high point in a period that nobody is ever going to forget. Oh, that's a great way to end. Thank you, uh, Eddie and Jerry, so much for joining us. Uh, and we all really appreciate the fact that you guys took the time, uh, you know, spent a little over over an hour here with us just to share. So uh, I think just on behalf of all the, these wineries and business owners, uh, thank you guys so much. Very appreciated. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we'll see you next week with uh, Mark and Al. Have a great day, everyone.